Good evening, church family. This is Pastor Mitchell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us for Bible study tonight. Uh, if you are with us via our Zoom conference call line, good evening. If you are with us via our Facebook page, I want you to go ahead and push share on your uh, on your Facebook. We want to make sure people have access to this and let them know that we're here in Bible study. If you're watching us via YouTube, we invite you to go ahead and type something in the comment section so that we know that you're with us tonight. Tonight, we're continuing in a series uh, entitled uh, God, Government and Grace. Power to the people is our main theme tonight. And we've been looking at before revival. We began this series looking at ways in which believers are to think about our engagement in government, um, our engagement in civic matters. As you all know, we're in the middle of a very um, important, very divisive um, political cycle. And so we wanted to look over these few weeks leading up to the election, ways in which believers ought to be a part of this business of government engagement as people of God. So when we were last together, we looked at our responsibility to pray, even in the midst of this season. We talked about how Paul lays out that we ought to come together in prayer and pray for those who lead us. We talked about how uh, we ought to pray for those who lead us, including our president and our governors and our mayors and our senators, those who have authority over us, as the scripture declares. Why? For peace in the city, right? We then talked about some of those prayers are imprecatory prayers where we're asking God, God, do what you say you're going to do in, in the word. Um, take care of those who are taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of the least and the lost and left out. Um, so we spent most of our time dealing with um, the power of prayer and the need for us to pray and to utilize our voices uh, through protests, through voting uh, as ways to do what we need to do as believers. Um, but on today, we're going to continue in our series tonight. And uh, we have a special teacher for us tonight. If you've been with us over the last few weeks in worship, uh, you've noticed that we have studying with us this semester, our pastoral intern, our pastoral intern, none other than Minister Nicole Strachan from New York. And you'll hear it as she's teaching, you'll hear a little bit of that New York accent coming out. But I'm grateful that she's with us over these next few months. As she's a student at uh, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union. Uh, um, and is doing her field education with us. So she's been in meetings. She's been in weddings. She's been in funerals. Um, she's been in worship. Uh, and now she has the opportunity to teach us the word of God as a part of uh, her internship with us tonight. So will you, for part two of our series, pull out a pen, pull out some paper. Uh, will you pray and show some encouragement for Minister Nicole Strachan, who will lead us in the study of the word of God tonight? Come on, Minister Nicole. Bless us with the word of God. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our Bible study tonight as we continue in the series, Power to the People, God, Government, and Grace. My theme for tonight is decisions, decisions, decisions. Let's start with an icebreaker. Have you ever played the game, Would You Rather? It's a question-based game uh, that gives really good questions and it gives you two choices. You have to pick the lesser, typically, of two evils. So for example, would you rather live a short life and be rich or have a long life and be poor? Questions like that that kind of make you feel like you wouldn't want to make a, a decision at all. Hasn't 2020 felt kind of like a game of would you rather? Would you rather be at quarantine at home with your kids 24-7? or brave going back into the office, masked up and socially distanced. All right. Sometimes 2020 has felt like a game of would you rather. But this year has brought very serious decisions, life and death decisions. And as the political climate gets more and more weird, we are faced with very tough decisions. Some are so overwhelmed that they have decided to tap out. And some of us are feeling like the best thing to do when faced with uncertainty and difficulties is to not make a decision at all. This is how some people feel that it's better not to know and come November, it's better not to vote. Now I can completely understand that feeling, but tonight I wanna to go through scripture and raise a biblical story and some books that help us to see that as Christians, we ought to make decisions no matter how tough they may be. 
First, I'll start with a disclaimer. You know the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, can be a little messy, and though the biblical story we're about to delve into offers much wisdom, I don't want to take the content of the story lightly. It may not be suitable for children, and I would also like to offer a trigger warning as it does surround a difficult topic, um, which is infant death. So I first heard this story as a little girl, and I have thought about it from many perspectives over the years, and I thought it was a good lens to look at it for our Bible series theme, Power to the People. I also would like to lift three things on tonight as to kind of frame um, our teaching, our lesson. First, the idea is that we are equipped to make decisions when we ask God for wisdom. Second, we are equipped to make decisions by our God-given emotions in the right context. And then third, we as Christians are called to make decisions as ethical mentors. And that's a phrase that's coined by uh, Reverend Dr. William Curtis in his book, Mentor Shift, that is so fitting for this time. Okay, so let's start uh, with 1 Kings 3, uh, 16 through 28. So that's 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 through 28. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's a little long, but I'm going somewhere with it, I promise. Sometime later, Two prostitutes, or harlots, came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them began, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were only two of us in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning, when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted. It certainly was your son and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said. The living child is mine, and the dead one is yours. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then the king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours, and each says the dead one belongs to the other. All right, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two, and give half to one woman and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh no, my Lord, give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, All right, he will be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, Do not kill that child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. And the last verse, When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. Now, a pretty strange story, for sure, but just to give you some background, Solomon had become a king as a very young man. He was probably less than 20 years old. And if you go earlier to the, in the chapter to around verse seven, uh, Solomon has a dream where he's talking with God and he tells him, like, listen, God, I'm, I'm young. I don't know the ropes. I'm not sure how to, to be a king. I'm not sure how to govern people. I'm not sure how to have a government and rule over people and make decisions. So he asks God for wisdom. And God is so impressed by this, he grants it. And of course, not even a few verses later, he's given an opportunity to exercise that wisdom. So sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. So when I think about the setting and the scene, I envision a courtroom where in come these two women who we learn are prostitutes or harlots. Now actually, it's interesting to note that at this time, it's not really illegal to be a prostitute and that also sometimes prostitutes were slaves. So it's important to highlight that their societal standing and titles 
um, are probably pretty low or not well regarded, but Sol that doesn't distract Solomon from the business at hand. Justice has to be served. And it's important for me that the text shows that he doesn't get stuck. He doesn't get weighed down by what might be sensational um, for that time. In fact, he realizes right away, it's a he said, she, she said argument, and that no matter what, the facts are tragic because it's something has happened and there needs to be a, re a resolution. So thankfully, Solomon had just asked God for wisdom to discern between good and evil and what's right. And it's with this wisdom that Bi the Bible tells us that Solomon writes over 3,000 Proverbs. And this is probably why most of the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are called wisdom literature and are often attributed to King Solomon. And Proverbs offers practical advice that shapes our character and virtue and values. And I think that's important as we start to think about how we think about things that come our way um, and how we can go about asking God for wisdom and shaping our character to be able to to really wrestle with some of the things that we're faced with even today, even right now. Um, so I wanted to look at some of the examples in scripture for godly wisdom. Uh, for example, in Proverbs chapter eight, we learn that wisdom calls and that wisdom is a readily available gift. It's a gift that's better than jewels. And even throughout the Proverbs, we hear wisdom being given like a, a a personification so we hear that wisdom calls and it raises its voice so it's available to us readily in 1st Corinthians first uh, 1 and 24 it says that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God and Jesus gives power to the people so we're empowered to God by God to live under this government with grace And in 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, we learn that we speak wisdom, though it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed, decreed before the ages of our glory. We need to pray and study and gain wisdom to make it through and to face decisions. But I think it's important to note that King Solomon does not only use wisdom, if we look close, he also is guided by emotion. When Solomon calls for the sword, the text says that the woman whose son was alive burned with compassion. In my studies, I found that the word compassion in Hebrew also means womb and mercy. So it was her maternal instinct and that pure emotion that distinguishes her from the other woman. Now to talk about emotions is tricky but it's an unavoidable part of our human experience. And of course, things that we see every day move us to feel anger, we can feel rage, we can feel uh, solemn, we can feel despair, we can feel joy, excitement. But this story shows me that when we have wisdom and we balance it with emotion, we can kind of make difficult decisions. So pretty much when we are led by godly wisdom and have an understanding of what is in front of us and then also pay attention to the way that something makes us feel we can kind of use those two things to balance each other to go forth and make a decision and certainly with godly wisdom and the Holy Spirit we have to discern our toxic emotions from those that can help shape our moral compass I would suggest that really in some way all the emotions we have are useful in some way or another and I, I want to lift another book that you can definitely take a look at, some other books of the Bible that you can look at to find more on those topics, because I think they're not often as raised, but they're very, very helpful to help us to understand the full span of our emotions, especially in a very emotional time as this. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, and also even the book of uh, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, because these books are full of the full span of our human emotions. Sometimes when we feel like life is so complicated that things just feel meaningless, well, there's scripture for that. Sometimes when we feel overwhelmed by the wickedness of people or things that are going on in this earth, there's scripture for that. And even more on wisdom in books like Ecclesiastes, as I mentioned. And if you're feeling passionate and want to feel hopeful or being motivated to be, feel hopeful, there's scripture for that. I invite you to delve into uh, the books that I mentioned, uh, which were Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes, and see where the Holy Spirit leads you.
because there are no simple answers to the complexities of our emotion. But I know it blesses and encourages me to read and to f feel relatable scripture that someone has felt or questioned the things that I have, even the things we don't like to talk about in church sometimes. So I hope it's helpful to you too. But let's get back to our topic. Uh, I want to also mention the fact that how to approach things during a different difficult time does require being in tune with godly wisdom and also using that to balance our emotion. So it's the way that we're empowered. It's the way that power is given to the people. So this is not a time to shrink. Perhaps the people of God are not having an impact because we aren't making decisions, because we are shying away from making decisions that are difficult. And sometimes it feels easier to say that God and government don't go together because we feel like we should pray on it and leave things like that to God. But I see from our story that the impact of Solomon's decision was that he gained street cred. He gained trust from the people. And by the end of chapter three, it says that all of Israel heard the judgment that the king had rendered in that case with the two women. And they were in awe because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. So the, and even the following chapter after that outlines how extensive his government grew. He had districts and officers, secretaries, scribes, and we learn of the magnitude of wealth and economic prosperity um, that they attribute to Solomon for the rest of the days of his life. And I think it's important to show how he was different in his culture and how he shaped his culture around him. Uh, I mentioned a book earlier that I really enjoy. Um, it's a book called Mentorship uh, by Dr. William Curtis. And I love this concept that he introduces as Christians, as ethical mentors. And he writes that during this era, we are called by God to be ethical mentors in the life of those around us. Whether we are pastors, church leaders, lay people, or, or lay people in the church. He goes on to say, we have a divine mandate to help others navigate the chaos of this new world with Christ as our touchstone. He says, we must be prepared to truly lead. We must study and be prepared. And the book goes on to cover very difficult and often controversial topics that I don't think we should shy away from. And at the very least, we should know a little bit about. But even further, I would say that a bigger point that the book makes that ties into our theme and this, what the scripture that we reviewed and the story is that we have the power as God's people, the transformative power that's in us and it's reflected in the glory of God as we bring Christ into this world. We do that by how we engage. With so much that is at stake, it's no wonder that some would like for no, nothing more from the, the church and the people of God to stay silent when this world is going a mess. But our voice is our power, our vote is our power, our engagement in life around us is our power. When you get some time, I really would love if you could delve into the first Kings chapter, peruse Proverbs, and get excited about Ecclesiastes, and sing the praises of Song of Songs. But I also want to leave you with some practical steps to take as you apply your heart and wisdom to making difficult decisions in this political and pandemic presidential climate. You may not feel that there are any good options to make decisions. And you know, this is not the end all be all and it's not exactly Bible, the steps that I'm kind of going to present, but there are definitely tools to apply to questions like, should I vote or not? Nah? You should. <laughs> uh, often we feel a situation or dilemma challenges us um, and it's usually because it conflicts with our personal ethics or our principle. Um, and those principles that we have are shaped by our morals and values, and th that's what influences our behavior. I mean, to think, to look back at the text, I, I looked at a lot of different perspectives on it, um, and there are even some Jewish scholars that pose the question of whether Solomon even picked the right woman, uh, or did he pick the right woman for the job based on how she moved and based on her emotions. And I think, in other words, when we're pushed up against a wall, challenged with limited options, we have to look at the necessary qualities um, uh, that are presented to us. So there are many models of applying ethics for which time does not allow me to go into further detail about. 
but an ethics 101 decision making process might be helpful and it might look something like this so for those times when there's some type of a turmoil you feel emotionally driven uh, to feel helpless maybe you can definitely go to God and pray ask God for wisdom Go to the scripture. See what the scripture says about wisdom. What does wisdom look like in the situation? What is it saying to you about how what what, what would be wise, or how to go about moving in a wise uh, direction? Then you can go through these steps and try to reach to a place where you feel that you are being wise and you're also being true to what your heart, what the spirit is saying to you. Um, and I found this uh, this process or this, these questions from the Ethics and Compliance Initiative. So the first step would be to gather the facts, the cold hard facts, not opinions or knee-jerk reactions or commentaries of others, but just really what the facts of the issues are. What is this candidate about? What is that candidate about? Um, just plain bare facts. <laughs> the second step would be to define the issue or problem. What exactly is a problem? What's bothering you? What is the problem that, uh, what is a larger problem that may be affecting others and yourself or your life or your world? Um, but just define what, what exactly it is. First, gather the facts. Not opinions or knee-jerk reactions, just the facts. As King Solomon did in his courtroom, he listened to the women, he didn't rush to make judgments, he, he understood what were the facts of the situation. The second is to define the issue or problem. So definitely being able to state what is the issue, what is the problem, what is the conflict of the situation or the conflict within you um, that's preventing you from feeling like you can make a decision. And I think in, for King Solomon, definitely uh, he knew that the problem was there was one living baby and that baby needed to, to have a mother and to have someone care. And there were many implications about that decision too. Um, that made that a grave decision and so looking at really all the factors and who's involved so for King Solomon he was not just weighing who the mother of the child was but also the woman who got the child also would have a little bit more of a better place in society a more economically stable one um, given the fact that she had a child so he had a lot of things at stake when he made that decision but he got right to what was at stake and what he needed to uh, solve so the third step would be identify alternatives. So you might want to kind of go through and say, okay, I can decide this way or I can decide that way. What are your options that you have? There's always more than one option and you, it would be great to definitely look through and make sure that you're looking at all alternatives to the situation or to answering the situation. The fourth step is to evaluate the negatives and positive, the positives of those alternatives. Like what's the impact and who's affected? So if I decide I know what the problem is, I know what the facts are, these are the different options. For each option, who's impacted here? Who's affected? And number five is to just make a decision. And this is the part that really kind of holds us up, but really um, it's the most important. And it's great to not be double-minded. As the scripture says, we have to figure out what is our decision? Where do we land on a topic? or an issue. Um, number six, implement that decision. So you've you've made the bold choice to make that decision. This is where you stand. This is what you feel convicted is the right decision. Go ahead and implement it. And then the seventh thing is to evaluate it. How well did that decision go? I mean, making a decision doesn't necessarily mean that it's always the best decision, but sometimes it's better to, to make a decision um, or the easiest decision isn't always. Um, come to us okay so we talked a little bit about wisdom so just to kind of recap where we are so far and then um, I'll tell you where we'll go next um, we talked a little bit about decisions and how hard that can be and how important it is as Christians and as a church that we make our decisions known and that we exercise our right to use decisions especially because we're we know that our decisions um, as people of God affect those around us spiritually and naturally and we have power in that. The power in God's people is the decisions that we make. Um, we talked about how wisdom and our emotions, our convictions, 
our unctions of the Holy Spirit, how those things can be balanced and help us to move forward and actually go through a process of decision making. But I want to touch on the last part um, of our theme, our Bible study theme. So it's God, government, and grace. And so I wanted to lift a couple of scriptures on grace because it's very important um, to always remember that although we do, we are kind of in the world and not of it, there's definitely like the grace factor that's buffering, <laughs> buffering the grace that we have to give ourselves. Because like I said before, we might not always make the best decisions, um, but we try to, we, we are prayerful about them but also the grace that we give to others, like our leaders and even our adversaries. And also, and most importantly, the grace from God. So those women that presented to Solomon, they definitely received a lot of grace because by many means, um, they may not have been treated with the best regard based on their social standing, but they got the grace um, to be able to approach Solomon with this case. And some have, some have posed the question that perhaps they had went to other courtrooms and not had their case heard um, or understood, and it had reached to that high level of um, being seen by being heard by the king, and so I think that's definitely a, a point about grace in that you know in that uh, in that moment. So I wanted to leave you with a few scriptures on grace. First, um, I'd like to lift Second Timothy two uh, and one uh, that tells us where our grace comes from. It says, "You then, my son." Or daughter, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ Jesus. The second scripture I'd like to raise is John chapter 1, uh, verse 17. It says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So I'd like to raise 2 Corinthians uh, 9 and 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things and at all times, even times such as this, it's my addition. <laughs> Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And lastly, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So, people of God, I beseech you to go forth with all power, to be decisive in all things and in all ways. Grace and peace, family. Good night. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister Nicole, for blessing us tonight. This is certainly an on-time word as we have heard uh, so many people who have talked about our, even in our presidential election, that we may be having to choose between two not so great choices in terms of our presidential election. Some have called this the, the, the lesser of two evils election. Uh, but we look at this decision that uh, that, that, that the king has to make on behalf of these two mothers. And it gives us some very practical and very biblical thoughts on how we ought to engage, even when we have no great decision ahead of us, as, uh, as King Solomon does in the case of this uh, young baby. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister Nicole, for lifting that for us tonight. And there may be some who are watching us tonight who don't yet have the God that gave King Solomon that kind of wisdom as a part of your life. If you are watching us and you want a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you want to get, uh, you want information on how to begin a relationship with God tonight, I want to invite you to type connect in the comment section. I want to invite you to send us an email at info at 31sbc.org. We would love uh, to hear from you. We would love to be able to help you to walk into a brand new relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or you may be watching us tonight. You have a relationship with God, but you need a church family. You need a body of believers to be a part of. I've been saying since the pandemic began, we don't care where you are. We've had brothers and sisters who have decided and desired to link with us 
from all over um, since we've begun this period of pandemic. So it doesn't matter where you are to me. If you want a church family, we'd love to be your church family. I'd love to be your pastor. Type connect in the comment section. Send us an email at info at 31sbc.org. And we'd love to get in contact with you and bring you in as a part of our church family. Church family, uh, before we go, there are a few things I want to lift for you. You know tomorrow we're in prayer at 12 noon via our Zoom conference call. And I hope that you will be a part of that experience. God has been meeting us in prayer each week. And it's an opportunity for us to be prayerful for brothers and sisters who are part of our family and are in need of prayer. As we think through prayer, we want to continue to be prayerful for the family of Sister Rita Winston. Uh, we uh, celebrated her homegoing service at the March funeral home this past Saturday. I had the privilege of uh, providing the eulogy and being the officiant for that service. I thank all of the 31st Street Baptist Church family. Uh, so many cards were read uh, from members of our church, members of our leadership team. Thank you for showing your love uh, to the Winston family in this tough season. And we are continuing to pray, not just for the Winston family, but also for the Adams family, for Brother Ricky and Sister Linda Adams, who experienced a devastating loss of their son, uh, Brother Ricky Jr., um, and we want to continue to hold them up in prayer, hold them up with love, send them cards, um, uh, check in on them. We just want them to know that we love them, that we're praying for them, and that we're with them in this difficult time. Amen. Amen. We also want to remind you as we leave uh, that there are a few things that are happening that you need to be aware of. We are still looking for media uh, media volunteers, those that may be interested in learning uh, how to uh, uh, utilize some of our tech equipment, video uh, to help us as backups and folks who are working on uh, the live stream. We're looking for volunteers who may want to get training uh, to help run the screens. We're even looking for volunteers who may have an interest in photography and videography to help us with our social media team. And so if you're interested in that, please send us an email um, with uh, at info at 31sbc.org or you can call the church. Let Miss Naomi know you're interested in training and learning uh, as a part of becoming uh, the ways in which we're expanding our media team. And I hope that you will take advantage of that experience. We're grateful for all of those who participated in our, our drive-in, drive-by flu clinic this past weekend. Uh, I think it was a tremendous success and I thank you all so much um, for being a part of uh, the ways in which we seek to partner with Bon Secours. We thank the Bon Secours uh, Health System for partnering with us. We want to make sure uh, that we are healthy, that we are whole, that we are safe in this season in the life of our church and in the life of our country. And we pray uh, that you will remain safe, that you will remain safe. Thank you all of those who participated in our homecoming revival season. We had a fantastic time in worship um, for not just homecoming Sunday, but our revival. So I want to thank all of you all who participated. It was a great time in the Lord, and I hope that you are revived in this season. Until we see you tomorrow in study or until uh, in prayer, rather, or until we see you Sunday for worship, I pray that God will keep you. Bless you, protect you, keep you safe, continue you to keep your family safe in this season. God, we thank you for the word of God that we received tonight from Minister Nicole Stratch. And thank you uh, for her presence among us in this season. And we pray that you will continue to grow her ministry. And we pray, oh God, that you will continue uh, to give her knowledge and insight as she continues to discern where you're calling her to be. Thank you for this season in the life of our church. We pray now that you will continue uh, to hold together all of our families, oh God, all of those who are represented on this line and that are part of our family, oh God, those who are dealing with bereavement, we pray, oh God, that you would be an anchor for their souls and their spirits. We pray for those who are sick, that you would help to make them well, oh God. We pray for our church and we pray that you would help us to continue to be a great witness on this corner uh, for your kingdom and for your people. Now bless us as we leave this time. Keep us safe until we're able to worship, to study, to pray one with another. We love you and we praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless your family. I love you. We'll see you tomorrow at prayer at 12 noon. We'll see you in worship on Sunday at 1030. God bless your family.